The following sermon, taken from the Gospel of St John, chapter 2, verses 7 to 10, was given by Dr Martin Lloyd-Jones on Sunday morning, the 24th of October, 1965. Unfortunately, the early part of the reading was actually missing from the master tape. So we now join Dr Lloyd-Jones during the reading. Then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. Then the summing up is this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Now we are looking at this account which is given here of this first sign of miracle which was wrought by our Lord at the marriage feast of Cana in Galilee. And as I'm explaining, we are interested in it not merely as an event in history, which it was, of course. These these are historical facts. These are records of events that have actually taken place. We are interested in it, rather, as uh, showing the way in which the greater blessings which our Lord came into this world to give us are to be received. In other words, I am suggesting still that the fundamental text for us to keep in our minds is the 16th verse of the first chapter of this Gospel according to St. John, where we read, and of his fullness, of all we received, and grace for grace. He came into the world and taught and lived and died and rose again and returned to heaven and is seated at the right hand of glory now, in order that you and I might receive of his fullness. That is the object and the end of the Christian message, the Christian gospel. He makes us sons of God, but in addition to that, he puts us into a position in which we can in this way receive of his fullness. Nothing, therefore, is more important than that we should know how we can receive of that fullness. And here, thank God, there is a great deal of instruction given us. There are many pitfalls. We are surrounded by difficulties, and there is our great adversary, the devil, who would ever lead us astray, can even transform himself into an angel of light and twist the scriptures in order to hinder us, as he has hindered us all. Therefore, nothing is more important for us than to discover the rules, the principles, which govern this whole matter. And I'm suggesting that in this miracle, We are given very great and valuable instruction on that very matter. And that's why we are looking at it together. If you like, I can put the whole thing like this. Take that hymn we've just been singing. Is it true of us? Were we singing our experience? That's the test, that's the question. We tend to sing the tunes and not the words. But this is what we sing, Jesus... The very thought of thee with sweetness fills the breast. There it is. And all that we went on to say. Now that is an expression of true Christianity. The man who wrote those words was writing his experience. That's why he wrote it. And that is, according to the New Testament, the position that we all should be in. We don't merely hold these things with our intellects. That isn't Christianity. But it's a life, and a whole life, and a full life. And it is, of course, especially related to him, of his fullness. Of all we received, and grace upon grace, an expanding, growing, continuing, increasing life. That's true Christianity. And as I'm trying to indicate, I'm calling attention to this not only that you and I might enjoy these great benefits for which the Son of God even laid down his life and died on a cruel cross. I'm not calling attention to it only for that reason, but for the further reason. That, as the history of the church demonstrates so clearly to us, it is when Christian people, those who make a profession of the Christian faith, are manifesting this kind of quality of life in their daily life and living, that the world is arrested and apprehended. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you don't do anything else. But I am here to say that that is ultimately the means of evangelism. The tragedy today, it seems to me, is this, that it's assumed 
that the church is all right and all you need to do is to get methods which will attract the outsider. This is the way to attract the outsider. For they're living next door to us. Or they're working at the next desk in the office. Or they're fellow students. Or they're in the same profession. And it is as they see this that they're arrested. That's how Christianity spread at the beginning. That, it, that is how it has spread in all the greater periods of reformation and of revival in the long story of the church. Very well. What can be more important than this, therefore? And here we are given, I say, in this pictorial manner, easy to apprehend some of these great principles. Now, we've already learned a number of them uh, through Mary. We've learned what we mustn't do. We mustn't dictate. We've got to start by submitting utterly. We've got to realize that he is Lord in these matters, and he's a sovereign Lord. He won't do things just when we ask him, and we mustn't be impatient and demand and insist. It's all wrong. He rebukes that. To that he says, Woman, what am I to do with thee? You don't understand. I do things in my own way and in my own time. There's the first great principle. And if we haven't learned that, there's no point in going on. If there is a restless, over-anxiety in your spirit or almost a complaint, well, you might as well give up. It's no good. It's a gift of God. And we have to obey this injunction that Mary gave to these servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And we worked that out last Sunday, seeing that it meant that we keep the commandments, trust and obey. In addition, have faith. Do what he tells you, though you don't understand it. Have faith. Go beyond that. Have trust. You fill the water pots, and they fill them up to the brim. Then he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. They believe. That's the testing moment. This moment of trust. When faith is no longer theoretical, but becomes practical. It becomes certain, and we do exactly what he tells us. In other words, I emphasized last Sunday that uh, there is a side of this matter in which we must be engaged actively. That it is his sovereign gift doesn't mean that we enter into a negative passivity. No, no. You can be passive and active at the same time. And there is no question about that at all. Now, there is that side then with which we have to start... Uh, what you and I have got to do. And the question is, I ask again, do we believe that? Are we putting that into practice? Do we realize that this is the high road to blessing? That if we are disobedient or rebellious in our lives, it's no use craving some unusual blessing. He works along this line. This is his method. The Bible is always consistent with itself. And the ultimate end and object of it all is to bring us to perfection. He's concerned about our sanctification, our holiness. Forgiveness is not the end. Escaping hell is not the objective. It is to be conformed unto the image of his dear son. Well, now then, there is our side of it, but let us move on to what is much more important, his side of it, his part in all this. And this, of course, is really everything. As I pointed out, that's the thing that hits you and strikes you. In the whole of this record, his presence, he dominates the whole situation. Why? Well, because the power is in him. It is his power. He manifested forth his glory. And in that glory, there is this power. It's the glory of the deity, the glory of the Godhead. He was the eternal son of God. And here, he manifests something of it. This omnipotence, this everlasting power. And uh, that is the thing I say that we've got to, got to realize. That it is all in him. This is, of course, the peculiarly Christian emphasis. That all blessings are in him. So that we are not interested in something which may be very good in and of itself and may even talk a lot about God the Father if it doesn't include him and make him central. We are not interested. It's not Christianity. That a man believes in God, that a man does good, doesn't make him Christian. You see, the apostle 
Paul puts it in writing to the Colossians in these terms, in the second chapter, verses 2 and 3. He says that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's it. Now, the New Testament puts this in endless ways. One of the commonest preps is uh, to refer to him as the head of the church in the figure of a body. And the head, of course, is the seat of all power, all the nervous energy. It's all there in the head, in the brain, and all the rest of the body is dependent upon that. The fullness, the power, the life, all comes out of this great head and then permeates through the remainder of the body. But the emphasis is, of course, that he is the head of all principality and power, that he is the head of the church, and all blessings, all power, everything, comes to us in him and through him and from him. In other words, as these people at the marriage feast of Cana of Galilee had reached a point at which they were utterly and solely dependent upon his ability, so are we, so are we, and this is one of the first things, therefore, we must of necessity realize. Now, the history of the church on this matter is very fascinating. I've often pointed it out to you before. One of the greatest snares at this point in many ways is the snare of what is called mysticism. And mysticism roughly can be put like this, you see, that you seek the God that is in you that the Spirit of God is in all men. And what you have to do, therefore, is to look into yourself and surrender to the Spirit of God that is in you. And they will instruct you how to do that. The various steps and stages of the mystic way, leading ultimately to the beatific vision. Now, I say that that can be a real snare and danger, and often has been, of course, because so often the mystics have relied entirely upon their method and have entirely bypassed the Lord Jesus Christ. Mysticism is always face to face with that danger of forgetting him. You see that in modern Quakerism, the Society of Friends and their teaching. That's the point at which they have arrived. Any teaching about an inner light and a method almost invariably does that. But it's no use, my friends, because it's all in him. All that is needed is concentrated in him. There he is seated like the others at the feast, but the energy and the power that is needed to deal with the situation is entirely and exclusively in him. And of course that is in many ways the great theme of this gospel according to John. Our Lord himself put it many times, and, no, and on no occasion did he put it more perfectly for our immediate object than when he said this, I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. He hasn't come to instruct us primarily, he's come to give us life. In him was life, and he has come to enable us to partake of that life that is in him. Here it is then, look at this marriage feast, there he is seated. All the power is concentrated in him, and what matters is what he does, and what he is able to do on that occasion. Now, our position is exactly and precisely that. And uh, the great lesson taught in the New Testament is the all-importance and centrality of our relationship to him, a living relationship to him, for it is only from him that we can receive this blessed fullness. And, thank God, the emphasis is that he is always able to do this, that with him nothing is impossible. Our hymns are full of this sort of thing. He speaks, and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. There it is. And that's the need of the whole of mankind by nature. Dead in trespasses and sins. We need life. He's able to do it. He speaks. He says, fill the water pots with water. Draw out. He speaks. And listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. There it is. Well, now then, let's see how this works itself out in practice. 
But before I do that, let me just sum up now these two sides or these two aspects in this whole matter. His part, our part. And I think it was summarized very perfectly in the last verse that we read at the beginning this morning in the second epistle to the Corinthians, the third chapter and the 18th verse. Listen to it. Here it is. We all, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are being changed into the same image from glory unto glory, even as by, as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, you notice the two elements. We all beholding, and that's something we go on doing. That's filling the water pots. That's the drawing. Beholding, that's our activity. If we don't behold, nothing will happen to us. We've got to do the beholding. We all beholding, looking upon, gazing upon, setting our our eyes steadfastly upon, that's the meaning of the word, and you go on doing it, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. You look for him, as Mary had the sense to do here after her initial blunder, and as these others did, well, you look to him. That's what beholding means, you look to him, you realize it's all in him, and you've got to look at him and keep your eye upon him and be responsive to him. This is activity. Beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Now, as we do that, this is what happens. We are being changed. We don't change ourselves. He changes us. Are being changed from glory to glory into this same like image as it is put there. Are uh, changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It is his Spirit alone that can do this for us. And we look, keep our eyes, our gaze upon him, and as we do so, he does this, he changes us from glory to glory, and on and on the process goes. Or oh, you've got it again in almost exactly the same way in Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Work out, work he works in. And so you've got it all here in this pictorial form. Fill the water pots, draw out the water. And then, and even while you're doing that, he is working the miracle. Very well, there we have emphasized uh, these relative activities. The activity of the believer, the activity of the Lord, of the Savior. But now let us go on and have a look at the nature of the blessing. This, of course, again, is something that is most wonderful for us, and nothing more encouraging and nothing more stimulating. What you and I have to realize, I think, first and foremost, is what is possible to us and for us. It's an amazing thing, but it's possible for us to be Christians and to read our New Testament diligently and regularly and really miss this. Isn't that the trouble with the church throughout the centuries? The failure to realize what is possible for us. You see, the New Testament epistles are full of that kind of thing. Take, for instance, the great epistle to the Ephesians. The apostle Paul has been reminding these people of what's happened to them and where they are and what they are. And then he tells them in the third chapter that he's praying with them. He bows down his knees unto the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he prays for them with great urgency and intensity. These people who are already believers and have got the seal of the Spirit upon them, what is it? Oh, that they may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the length and breadth and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. He says, you don't realize that. I want you to. I remind you. He says it in the first chapter to them. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what, what is the hope of your calling, and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and the exceeding greatness of his power to us with that believe. We live as paupers. Why? Well, very largely because we don't know our inheritance. We're not meant to live as paupers. We were meant to live as princes and to enjoy of this great wealth that he has come to make available. The unsearchable riches of Christ, 
That's what we are meant to have. And I say it is very largely because of a, a kind of initial difficulty to apprehend this and to realize that this is meant for us, that it's true for us. That the New Testament is as applicable to us as it was for the first century Christians. I notice a tendency, a teaching creeping in at the present time, which seems to me to cut out most of the New Testament. That was only for the first Christians. They say, don't take too much from the book of Acts. It was only for the first Christians. And then, of course, they're bound to say the same about the epistles. For they were written to the first Christians also and assumed the book of Acts. And thus, you see, the spirit is being quenched. And men and women are told that they've already got everything they can ever receive, and all they've got to do is to go on quietly surrendering themselves. That seems to me to be a negation of the whole of the New Testament teaching. Let me show you what I mean. What is the nature of this blessing? Well, let me divide it up according to what we are told in this illustration. Into, under two main headings. Let us look for a moment at the general character of this blessing. Before we come to the particulars, look at its general character. And the first thing that we've got to emphasize, of course, is this, that it is miraculous. It is miraculous. That's obvious, of course, in our story. This first miracle, this beginning of miracles, a sign, a miracle. And that, as I've reminded you already, means the action of God. It is God alone who can do this. And it is the very essence of this teaching. As that which happened in Cana of Galilee was a miracle, so entering into and receiving of his fullness is a miracle. It's nothing less. And this is so vital. It is something, I say, entirely supernatural. It is something which is the result of the activity of God. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, says Paul to the Romans. Why? Well, because it is the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believeth. Christ, he says to the Corinthians, is the wisdom of God and the power of God. It's powerful. These are the New Testament terms. A Christian is not a man who absorbs a certain amount of our Lord's teaching or a Christian philosophy. That's not Christianity. A man can do that who's just a natural man, an unchanged man, a man who belongs, as it were, to Adam. That's quite feasible. It's often happened. People have often borrowed the Christian ethic and the Christian teaching, but that doesn't make them Christians. What makes a man a Christian is that God has worked a miracle in him, and it is nothing less than a new creation. It's a new birth. It's the giving of a new life. These are the terms that are used. Or take the way, again, the apostle puts it to the Ephesians, he was he quickened, who were dead. That's the difference between a man who is not a Christian and a Christian. It is the difference between a man who is spiritually dead and a man who is spiritually alive. Now, that's the matter of life. And no man can ever produce life. It's impossible. God alone is the author of life. And that is why I'm emphasizing this miraculous character all the blessing that is offered to us in Christ Jesus. We are not promised that we shall be better men, but what we are promised is that we shall be new men, that we shall be entirely different. What is Christianity? Well, let's use the famous title of the old book of Henry Skookle. It is the life of God in the souls of men. Now, the importance of this, you see, comes out like this. Once more, I commend the historical approach to you. And if you do that, you will know that uh, 250 years ago, or a little less, what really led to that great evangelical awakening in the 18th century, in its ultimate source, was the reading of that book by Henry Skogel, by George Whitfield and John and Charles Wesley. That was the thing that first disturbed them. They had been brought up in the church, brought up as Christians, troubled by their consciences, tried to live a better life, tried to be more moral, indeed tried to do a lot of good. But they couldn't find satisfaction, and yet they didn't know what was wrong. Though, remember, they were not only Christians and not only reading the Bible, but were even students of it, destined for the church, being trained for the ministry. They didn't understand this. And this was the thing that really, ultimately, 
set them on the road that led to their receiving of this great fullness and of their amazing unparalleled usefulness. What was it? Well, you see, they read this book by old Henry Skugel, who had lived in the previous century in Scotland. And that was the whole point of Skugel's book. That Christianity, after all, is not merely the application of Christian teaching. It isn't merely a higher morality which a man adopts and which he strains to put into practice. It isn't it. It is essentially the working of a miracle in the soul. It is the act of God. It is God putting his own life, as it were, into the souls of men. And they were at once aware that they knew nothing about this, that they hadn't got it. They were good men. They were religious men. They even fasted. They went out of their way to do good and suffered scorn and ridicule. But no, it didn't matter. They knew that they hadn't got this life inside them. They had not become partakers of the divine nature. This was something entirely strange to them. They'd never even thought of it. They said, ah, but we've been doing this and that, and it leads us to nothing. We see now that Christianity essentially is something God does to us. It is the implanting of this seed of divine life within us. The whole thing that is thought, of course, in the first epistle of John, as it is here everywhere in this gospel, and indeed in the whole of the New Testament. Now, here is the first thing. There in the marriage feast of Cana of Galilee, the whole situation is transformed solely by the supernatural action of our Lord. He acts. He does something. It's a creative action. Oh, well, let me put it in that great phrase of the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You see his comparison. He says, what's happened to me is comparable to what happened at the original creation. It is God commanding light to shine forth in darkness. And he's done that to me in my heart, he says. Well, you see, here it is. Or, take again, we read it this morning, in 2 Corinthians 3.3. 3. Same thing. He says, you are the epistles of Christ, known and read of all men. Manifestly declared, he says, to be the epistles of Christ, ministered by us, but written, not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tables of stone, but in the fleshy tables of the heart. Now, this is real, true Christianity. The action of the spirit of God, writing a new name in our hearts, doing something within the depths and the vitals of the personality. You see, the comparison that the apostle uses, and it's a very important one and a very vital one, and it's needed today as it was needed then. You see, the comparison that the apostle uses, and it's a very important one and a very vital one, and it's needed today as it was needed then. He contrasts the position of a Jew under the Old Testament dispensation with the Ten Commandments written and engraven on stone. He says it isn't that. That's the letter. This is the spirit. And it isn't written, therefore, with ink, as it were, on tables of stone. This is altogether different. This is a writing on the fleshy tables of the heart. And nobody can do this but the Spirit of God. Paul there says, even he hadn't done it, ministered by us. He'd come in as it were, he was used as an instrument, but it wasn't his writing, it wasn't his work. There is only one who can perform this work. It is the Holy Spirit of God, sent by Christ. The power is in him. And it is in this way that he does it, this act of new creation. The implantation of the seed of divine life down in the very depths and abysms, as it were, of our souls and spirits and beings. Now, that's the thing of which we are reminded here. You see, it isn't that something was put into the water which made it nice and tasty. No, there's a radical operation. There is a change here, and it is miraculous. And, of course, this is the teaching. Every Christian is a miracle. To bring anybody from death to life is a miracle. 
And that's exactly what happens to us all spiritually uh, when we become truly Christian. You was he quickened. You was he raised together with Christ. Very well then, there is the first great point, but let me hurry to a second. And the second point about it is the suddenness. The suddenness with which it happens. Now, don't misunderstand this. I am going to emphasize that it uh, is also a process and a gradual one, but I start with the suddenness. And I've got to do this, not only because I must be true uh, to the incident which we are analyzing, but because I must be true to the whole principle taught in this connection in the whole of the New Testament. I've got to emphasize this aspect because it is the only way to put ourselves in a safe position as over and against the manuals of devotion and the process which is taught by the mystics in the Roman Catholic Church and by others who imitate them and who follow them. We have got to keep it distinct and discreet that it is his action, that it is a miraculous action, and therefore it is something that can happen in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. It happened here. Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it, but it had already happened. And this is an aspect of this Christian life and this receiving of his fullness that we must never lose sight of. Let me illustrate what I mean. You see this so often in the recorded experiences that many have left to us of their knowledge of Christ and of how they entered into this knowledge and received of his fullness. And what you find with a strange regularity and constancy is this, that here are men and women who are disturbed. At last, they've seen there's something wrong. They're dissatisfied with the Christian life they've been living. They say, when I really look at the New Testament and then look at myself, I see the disparity. Or when I sing those hymns, I sing those hymns, but when I stop and think what I'm singing, I know they're not true of me. And I'm being a hypocrite. I'm not singing my own experience. Now, they've become disturbed. And then they begin to seek and to search. And they may go on doing so for a long time. But nothing seems to happen. Then you will find that almost without exception, they say, suddenly. Everything became clear to them. Something happened within them. Something was done to them. And out of the darkness and the despair and the sense of hopelessness and futility, there came great joy and peace. Now I say, I could keep you not only for the rest of this morning, but for many, many mornings in giving you examples and illustrations of this. You will find, I'm not talking about conversion, I'm talking about Christian people who are living still, as it were, under the law, who suddenly are lifted to another level and go on living on the mountain tops of the Christian life and the Christian faith. That's the thing we are dealing with. I'm preaching to Christian people, and I'm just trying to show you what is possible to us as Christians. The tragedy is we come into this life, so many of us, and are content with forgiveness and the first beginnings, and then just go on living a kind of moral life using Christian terminology. But there it is. It's a life of failure and often of frustration, and it lacks this great power and principle of assurance that characterizes the New Testament people. Now then, here they are, I say, and that is their testament. Happened suddenly. Everybody knows the famous examples of Charles Wesley and John Wesley. That's how it happened to both of them. Suddenly. And that is how it has happened, I say, to innumerable saints, well known and unknown. But I'm not confining this solely to the realm of individual experience. It is here, I think, we find our only comfort and consolation when we look out at the whole case and position of the Christian church as a whole. And here again, you see, the testimony of history is of such inestimable value to us. The whole story of the church, in one sense, can be described as a series of Pentecosts. I mean by that, a series of revivals. Here's the picture. At the first beginning, there they are met together for prayer in the upper room, waiting Praying, pleading. Suddenly, 
there was a sound as of a mighty rushing wind. Suddenly. And then you go on in the history of the church. That lasts for a while, it begins to wane. Down you get into a dull trough. And again some people are disturbed and awakened and begin to seek and to pray and to plead with God. And they may do so for years and nothing happens. Then suddenly, and often unexpectedly, something happens again. The Spirit is poured forth upon them. That is what we mean by revival. The descent of the Holy Ghost upon a number of God's people together. And the whole situation is transformed. Exactly as it was in Cana of Galilee. This tremendous thing. He's active. So that we are bound to emphasize this particular aspect. I say it is here that one is filled with a sense of hope for the Christian church. If it were always and invariably a gradual process of development and of increase, well then I at the present moment would be filled with a sense of despair, for things are not getting better but they're getting worse. But because of this principle, you see, that doesn't daunt one, that doesn't upset one at all. For we know this from the long history of his activity in his church, that that's exactly how he's happened. He seems to withdraw himself. Things go down and down and down until the church seems to be finished. And when she's completely hopeless, he arises. He speaks, throw out the water. And they draw out and they find that it is this perfect wine. That's how it's always happened. No, that doesn't mean, as I say, let me remind you again, that we do nothing and sink therefore into a state of passivity. No, no, fill the water pots. Fill them up to the brim. Do everything he tells you. Don't leave anything undone. Act with all your might. Fulfill all the conditions. But remember, the power is his. It's miraculous. It can happen at any moment, suddenly, when least expected. It's the hope for every individual in this congregation this morning. I'm sure I'm speaking to many who are almost at the point of despair, in this way, that you felt a dissatisfaction with the quality of your Christian life, perhaps for years, some of you. And you've been doing this and that and praying, but you say, nothing happens. Is it all hopeless? My answer to you is this. No, at any moment, when you least expect it, sometimes a light surprises the Christian while he sings. It is the Lord who rises with healing in his wings. Because it is his power, because it is his prerogative, he can do it whenever he likes, at any moment, in spite of the conditions, as it were. He demands them, and you and I must keep them. He is not tied to them. He can act in his own sovereign manner at any moment. He's done it in the history of the church. He has done it in the history of individuals. He can do it, and he will do it, in the history of every individual who does whatsoever he tells us, and who waits in faith upon him. But let me come to the last point for this morning, which is the secret aspect of this. And this is to me something very wonderful. Did you notice this? When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, then in brackets, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. What's this mean? Oh, this is the secret aspect of this matter. The master of the feast, the ruler of the feast, he'd been at many similar feasts. He said, This is extraordinary. I've never seen anything like this before. This is unusual. He was amazed. He didn't understand. But the servants which drew the water knew. What's this? Well, I say this is the secret aspect of this whole matter. And it's a tremendously important one. This, you know, ultimately is the real proof of whether we've got this life of God in our souls or not. What do I mean? I mean this. The effect of what our Lord did was to fill the master of the feast with amazement, astonishment, and surprise. He doesn't understand. But isn't that what we are told everywhere? In the book of the Acts of the Apostles, when the Holy Ghost descended upon those men in the upper room on the morning of the day of Pentecost, the whole populace marveled, they wondered, what is this? They don't understand. The authorities in the Sanhedrin, looking, beholding Peter and John, and observing that they're unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. 
What is this? They don't understand it. But you know, it's always like that. The natural men receive not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, says Paul. Neither can he receive them, for they are spiritually discerned. And then he goes on to say this in 1 Corinthians 2.15. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. What does that mean? It just means this. He that is spiritual, the man who has the Spirit of God in him, is a man who has understanding. He judges. He understands. He has an apprehension. He has a knowledge. The servants that drew the water knew the thing in brackets. He knows the secret. He understandeth all things. Yet he himself is not understood by anybody else. The natural man not only doesn't understand the gospel, he doesn't understand the Christian. Why? Well, because something has happened to the Christian that is beyond explanation. It is miraculous. It cannot be understood. And that is why the wise and the prudent are always rejecting this gospel. They want to understand it. Fools that they are. Who can understand a miracle? Of course they don't understand it. And you just shouldn't be surprised that all the clever people in the world today, as it were, are denying this. The philosophers and scientists, they're blind. They're natural men. They can't understand miracles. They can't understand any more than the master of the feast could understand in the marriage of Cana of Galilee. But the ignoramuses, the servants, they know they were with him. They saw it happening. They knew it. All. They didn't understand ultimately, but they knew how it had happened. They knew it was he. They've got an explanation. So, says Paul, is the case with every man. He may be unlearned. He may be very ignorant. But if this has happened to him, he knows. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no men. He becomes an enigma, a problem, a puzzle to everybody who isn't a Christian. My dear friends, this is what you and I are meant to be. We are meant to be such people that the world with which we live doesn't understand us. It should be amazed at us. It should be astonished at us. It should say, what is the secret of this? Now, this is something, I say, that is beyond understanding. And it is not and never is the result of a rational process of reasoning. It's independent of reason. It's beyond it. It's in a higher realm. It is the action of God in the souls of men, giving us the mind of Christ, giving us an understanding. You don't arrive at it as the result of study or meditation. He gives it. Now, let me close, therefore, by giving you a quotation which illustrates all this very perfectly from uh, Cotton Mather, whom I quoted some three or four weeks back, I think, a brilliant learned man in America, at the end of the 17th and the early part of the 18th century. An outstanding genius in every way. His academic record proves that. But listen to what he tells us. He was unhappy in the sense I'm describing. And he wanted rest and peace. He wanted to know of a short. He wanted a full assurance of his acceptance with God and his salvation. Of course, he believed it all. He'd been brought up to believe it. He'd been trained as a theological student to believe it. He knew it all and he believed it all. And yet he was restless and unhappy. And one day he said, he sat down and he put down on paper the arguments to prove that he was forgiven. He took the scriptures. He said, I believe them. Therefore, I must believe what they tell me. He believes in the Lord Jesus Christ as an all-sufficient Savior. He put all this down on paper. He was going to reason it out. He was going to prove to himself beyond any doubt he must be a child of God, forgiven and accepted. And so he went through the whole process. And then he said, I look for my, in myself for some of the signs and the marks of a man who is truly Christian. What are they? Well, confession of sin, self-judging, self-humiliation, according to 1 Corinthians 11.31. He did all that. He put it all down on paper. And now he was going to prove to himself that all was well. But this is what he says. Thus did I try to argue myself into the faith and hope of my justification. But I must say that I found no spirit in all this rational way of arguing. None of the argument brought unto my soul the joyful peace which I wanted. At last, the Spirit of God powerfully came in upon my heart and enabled me to receive the pardon of my sin offered freely unto me with the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this, without any distinct considerations, on my having these and those conditions wrought in me. Then could I, and never till then, rejoice with joy 
unspeakable and full of glory. Afterwards, it was comfortable for me to see in myself the conditions of a pardon soul. Now you see what he said. Here's a man with unusual reasoning ability, rational powers. He tries to reason himself into it. He says, I couldn't. I was cold. There was no spirit in it. Then suddenly, the spirit of God did this very thing. You know, there are too many Christians in the church today whose assurance is based only upon their deductions. They've been trained like that. People have said to them, come, here you are, look at this verse. He that believeth is not condemned. Do you believe? Yes, well, you're not condemned. There's your assurance. And they, they've never got anything more. They stop at that. But you know, that didn't satisfy cotton men. Though. It shouldn't satisfy any of us. There is a higher assurance. The assurance given by the blessed Spirit of God. And it is only he, it is only that, that enables a man to rejoice with a joy unspeakable and full of glory and really to sing meaning it. Jesus the very thought of thee with sweetness fills my breast. But sweeter far thy face to see and in thy presence rest. But let me end with two lines that we sang in that same portion of that hymn. Here it is. The love of Jesus, what it is, none but his loved ones know. You either know it or you don't. You can't really tell anybody what it is. They don't understand. It's not something arrived at as the result of a rational process. There is a secret element. The master of the feast is astonished and amazed but the servants that drew the water, they knew the secret. This is the secret. It is only known by those who have received it. So let me put it to you like this. As you find it in the book of Revelation, in the second chapter and in verse 17. Here's the same thing. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the hidden manna? And will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that hath received it. Now, my friends, here's the question. Are you partaking of the hidden manna? This food to eat of, this water to drink of that the world doesn't know. Our Lord said that about himself when they were worrying about him not having any food. He says, I have food to eat of that you know not of. And here it is, the Christian has it. The hidden manna, the world doesn't know it. It's not in your supermarkets. It's not advertised in your papers. The world doesn't know anything about it. And there are many inside the church who know nothing about it. The hidden manna, feasting on the bread of heaven. Hidden. And have you got the white stone? And in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Have you ever prayed to him? Write thy new name upon my heart, thy new best name of love. And do you know that he has written it? Has he written the name on the white stone? Have you got this secret knowledge of him and his life-giving, satisfying power? Well, my friends, we must leave it at that for this morning. But there are some of the principles taught us in that old incident of the first miracle wrought in Cana of Galilee. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide and continue with us. Now, throughout the remainder of this, our short, uncertain earthly life and pilgrimage, and until we shall see him face to face and see him in all the fullness of his glory. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, 
that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.